Thank you. Uh, thank you, Henry. Um, thank you, Ben, for organizing. Um, Henry's had some of this before because we did it at the LGS, but I'll, I'll try not to pe repeat myself too much. Um, I will read from my notes a bit. Uh, but obviously, all of us want to make sure that our theory is fun and sexy. Uh, <laughs> so it's about time we did that. Uh, I, I mean, I look across the room, and it might be a heartland of theory, but I don't see a lot of sexy theory happening uh, in the department. So we need to see more of that. Um, OK, there's, I think the book, the problem at the heart of this book, um, which Henry sort of mentioned, uh, is, is two questions, which I think are really important. One is, how can human geography thrive in an uncertain time of post-pandemic climate crisis and economic and social inequality? And the second is, how can geography reach out to influence the wider social and natural sciences, which we've explored a little bit more? I think both those questions are really important. And in response, uh, I think the book is compelling, it's insightful, I learned a huge amount from it. I think it's incredibly valuable. I don't disagree, actually, with a lot uh, of it at all. Uh, I think it's a great outline and perhaps defence um, of what critical realism can offer about how we think about theory and what theory might do. Um, that's not what you can do for discipline, but what you know, the discipline do for you, etc. It's a book that is unafraid to ask big questions about how geography as a discipline uh, might thrive, uh, as Henry puts it, both in the wider social sciences and to different kinds of publics. So I'm sure this is going to become a central reference point in this book for how we think about geography and theory. And so my questions then here will be more about where the book leaves other ways of doing theory, um, of making conceptual abstractions from the empirical world. And here I think there's a slight contradiction in the book between sort of being open to different forms of theorising on the one hand and making a case for a particular kind of theory on the other. So the key problem uh, the book argues is that geography is characterised by, quotes, an excessive fragmentation of approaches and concepts, uh, few, uh, with, with too few substantive theories explaining geographical phenomena as we've heard. So the problem uh, is that over the past couple of decades in particular, human geography has become dominated by approaches that focus on describing and interpreting all kinds of everyday practices, contexts, events and relations. There's been a fixation with process, Processes connected to the network, to the effective, the performative, to multiplicity, and so on. Processes which too often conflate with causality. The field is dominated by post-structural, post-phenomenological, and post-humanist accounts, which have largely replaced the previous dominance of critical realism. Uh, so while there's a particular focus of critique in the book um, on post-structuralism, especially uh, actor network theory, and non-representational theory and assembly thinking, so nobody in the room. Uh, um, uh, uh, but there's also, there's also a, a bunch of other work which is, which is kind of explored um, uh, as kind of wanting in terms of its explanatory theory. So um, much recent feminist work, for example, influential in geography, is, quote, interpretive, exploratory, imaginative, or even speculative, embracing ontological contingency and disavowing the more causally explanatory feminist Marxist approach to the 1980s and early 1990s. Uh, sometimes a little hint of nostalgia in some of the writing. Um, Post-colonialism uh, uh, does not represent a coherent theory um, in geography of explanation, but instead offers conceptual strategies and methodological approaches, and only occasionally more explanation-focused work, such as Tariq Jazeel's discussion of representational mechanics, which we heard about when Henry spoke earlier. Other areas, too, are held to account dialectics and Marxism, explanations of neoliberalisation, in uh, political economy work in geography are both found to often be fuzzy about causal mechanisms um, that would better explain geographical conditions. So it's important to say that the book is not dismissive of these theoretical preoccupations over the past two decades, these kind of non-causal uh, mechanistic uh, um, forms of theory. And in fact, the readings in the book are generous, engaged, rigorous, uh, dialogic, careful, um, and, and, and highly enjoyable to read. I think it's really important to say that. Nonetheless, many of the research areas and debates, not all, are positioned in the book as insufficiently normative, vague on causality, overly descriptive, sometimes too preoccupied with their own conceptual languages and meanderings, and not sensitive enough to the politics of difference, power, and social inequality. And of course, the book is not alone in making these kinds of critiques of much of the work that has been going on in human geography over the past couple of decades. And personally I, should, personally, I should say that I think most of these critiques are actually reasonable, um, reasonable enough positions and, uh, to uphold. Um, but in making these critiques, these critiques, it is also a book with an occasional sting. 
the book has uh, a pop at geographers who seem to be concerned with, quote, career-enhancing esoteric theory. Uh, there's too much textual gymnastics, not enough clear-headed explanation. Um, the book has a go at geographers who are concerned with merely reporting on the lives of excluded subjects rather than developing theories or practices that could generate change. As the book later puts it, clever words alone do not make politics. And so as it advances its arguments, the book is not afraid to get its elbows out. Um, in fact, this is, this is the contradiction that I was talking about at the start, I think, this in the book. The book is trying to join hands with different theoretical stripes, but there's also a wee bit of angular elbow coming out just as you're kind of reaching for the hand. Uh, there's a little bit of an elbow. Um, so the solution, the book argues, as we've been hearing, is a form of theory that is explanatory, focused on causes, based on mechanism-based thinking of a non-deterministic kind, and mid-range theories that hover between capitalism's continuous reformations on the one hand, and sort of everyday life and practice on the other. So better explanatory theory will make geography more relevant, the book suggests, uh, to, uh, to other academic and non-academic contexts. So this is an appeal to focus more on the epistemic and less on the ontological, uh, which, as the book says, is better left to the philosophers often. Um, so we hear, for example, Henry talking earlier about philosophy envy, um, which I think actually, you know, I think there's, there's something in this. Uh, I, I think there is uh, uh, certainly, there have been moments for the past couple of decades when, when I think that, you know, geographers have uh, um, uh, uh, perhaps become, there's been a sense in which more philosophical work is also more sophisticated geography. I think that sense has been there over the past couple of decades, few decades. Um, although I also wonder if that moment has kind of passed uh, now. Yeah, that target is perhaps no longer the concern that it, that it may have been, concern that it may have been. Um, so again, this argument is put forward in a generous and dialogic spirit. Uh, the book does not reject uh, this focus on practice, process, specificity, context, the everyday and so on in contemporary human geography. Instead, it's to supplement that work uh, with a focus on explanation, a focus on, as the book puts it, what really makes things happen. So it's a case for theory with practical adequacy, as we will say. So on the one hand, I admire the clarity of, with which the book defines an approach to theory and the sense of mission that it brings. There's a, there's a kind of energizing argument running through the book. There's a clear sort of North Star uh, and a hope for better interventions in a world of inequalities and crises. On the other hand, I was left with concerns, and it comes out of this contradiction that I talked about at the start, that I think is in the book. One is that theory, which is not normative and explanatory, is left looking a little bit like the poor cousin. Um, such theory doesn't quite cut the mustard. It may not even really be theory. At one point, for example, Henry writes, practically adequate theories cannot be just about change in our mental constructs nor perceptual operations, that is a self-indulging kind of intellectual luxury in the ivory tower, early in the book. I think there's a risk there in this kind of line of argument, even though I don't actually think this is the book's intention, uh, uh, but we're left feeling like we have a choice. Either you're doing good theory that is explanatory, mid-range, useful, makes a change, potentially makes a change, or you're doing less adequate theory, however interesting it might be, which risks, risks becoming self-indulgent intellectual privilege. And I think there's a tension in the book then between, these, between this welcoming hand of dialogue and, and, and these different approaches to theory, advocating pluralism, and this, this, this tendency nonetheless to downgrade certain kinds of theoretical work. So what about then theoretical work that doesn't fit the explanatory mid-range theory position? Theoretical work that seeks, for example, to experiment with new concepts or ideas, that is about pursuing a curiosity. The aim to develop an understanding of what's going on or illuminate the nature of a place or event or condition, but which does not follow this theoretical North Star. There's a fundamental question here, not just about geography and theory making, but about the very nature of academic research and the social sciences. Is there a mission to explain and change the world? Should we even be talking about ourselves as having a mission? Are different theoretical approaches equally valid? Or are some more valid than others? Are explanations explanation or social change the yardsticks by which we should judge theory and if so how does that help encourage other kinds of theoretical experimentation and development what's great about this book is that it makes us ask these questions as Sarah said it puts these bigger questions which we've not necessarily been asking and reflecting on as in the field at the center of our thinking 
And as these questions that I'm asking might imply, I'm not entirely at ease with arguments that enable a kind of hierarchy between types of theory, however generous, inclusive, and welcoming those arguments are. I'd want instead to imagine these different theoretical approaches as tools that we might use in different contexts, in relation to different aims or different audiences. Any given theory or approach to theory is only useful for the work that it allows us to do in a given context. But that work might well vary from context to context. So I can think of cases in my own work where I've used theory in an explanatory way, but I can also think of cases where I've used theory in an illustrative way, or in a descriptive way, um, or in a speculative way, or as a way of seeing something differently, or disrupting how a problem is understood in my own work or thinking and so on. So I've got my reservations here not just because I see value in an explicit defence of theory that doesn't have an express utility, in terms of how utility is being defined in this conversation, but also because, in any case, it's not always immediately clear that a theory is useful or not. We, we don't, when, do we, when do we know, at what point do we know, if a theory is practically adequate, for example? Theory might, st theory might start out life as seemingly disconnected from a particular problem, seemingly useless, but then later, or perhaps years down the line, become translated and changed in ways that make it practically useful in the way we've been describing it here today. So it's possible that a theory that doesn't seem practically useful now will be later. The world is messy, it's unpredictable, so is intellectual work, so is theory and its potential. You cannot decide in advance if theory does or does not have practical adequacy because we don't know what context that theory will be used in in the future. So how then do we start to judge the quality and adequacy of a theory now? when we don't know what might happen to it 5, 10, 15 years down the line. We can all look at the way in which theory has morphed and translated over time, from feminism into mainstream development studies and all over the place, and see those kinds of moments where theory becomes practically adequate in ways that are surprising. I was also concerned, I'm finishing up, um, because I can see Ben shuffling, uh, uh, about the distinction between explanation as a theoretical good, on the one hand, and description, or mere description, on the other. And I think this is a familiar distinction, we probably all have views on this, but I think there is more to value and to say about the work that description can do. Um, so what about forms of theory, for example, that, that, that find explanation through thick description of chains of events and processes? So we can think about non-reductive ethnographic ex uh, description in, in anthropology or in, uh, uh, in some approaches inspired by actor network theory. Uh, we might think about something completely different, like the long history of investigative journalism, which has shown us uh, um, that explanations of what happened and why can emerge through the drip drip of detailed description. Um, uh, so these different forms of descriptive work might have distinct ways of identifying causal mechanisms. They might not talk about causality in terms of mechanisms. They might, for example, be less explicit about establishing causes, or they might want to understand the limits of, of, of what it means to identify key causes in the stories that they want to tell. But that does not mean that they don't lead into explanation and potentially even social change. And I think this is in the book, but something that I felt could be drawn out a little bit more. Um, and then just the last point I want to just return to what I opened with, which is um, the, the claim that geography suffers from excessive fragmentation of approaches and concepts. And I guess I'd like us to discuss, or to think about um, uh, that, if possible, uh, because um, to be honest, I usually find myself uh, uh, sort of thinking the precise opposite, um, which, which is that actually one of the things I found exciting about being a geographer over the past two or three decades, um, and it's hard to believe it's been that long, because uh, uh, you're looking at me from, he just said his PhD, that guy, surely. But the, 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 um, one of the things I've been exciting about it is the experimentation of those two decades, those last few decades. And I think that's also something that Henry shares um, in his book. The willingness to try out new perspectives and ideas from all kinds of sources, to attempt to develop ideas around unlikely dialogues which were not happening uh, before this period of experimentation. The, the, a diverse body of work, and I think again the book shows this, which has expanded the range of actors, situations and practices that we explore, which has opened up new conceptual, ethical, and political questions. I think there's a lot to say about the ethical questions that have been opened up, which don't get a lot of traction in the book, which is fine, because it's not what the book's about. But it's given, it's given rise to a new spirit of experimentation and methodologies and forms of representation. Um, and I think it's opened up new collaborations with other disciplines. 
uh, which, which uh, are the edges of this, uh, uh, where geography has been bleeding into other areas. Uh, perhaps not in a, in, a, in a big way, but in small ways, in more modest ways. So I think, it's, I think that it's fine, of course, to characterise this as excessive. Of course it is, uh, uh, if that's your judgement. But once we do that, we perhaps inevitably end up in the territory of undermining that spirit of experimentation and dialogue.